Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are gathered here for the first Revati and Satya Nadam Atlul Lecture, uh, award, Chair Award Lecture. About um, a year and a half back, we began a process of trying to bring into IISC 90 chairs to be held by faculty of the Institute based purely on their academic performance of which uh, 20 would be for associate professors, 10 for full professors, and 60 for young investigators, assistant professors. So uh, after a year or so of looking around, we finally got a donor in the way of Professor uh, Satya Luri, who has uh, endowed this chair in the name of his wife and him. Um, today, uh, to preside over this lecture, we have uh, a very distinguished uh, member of our community, Professor Rama Rao, who is also a council chairman. I'll briefly introduce him. Then he will talk about the uh, um, uh, talk about the donor himself, whom he knows. And then Professor Mesh Varshne will um, uh, will introduce the speaker. So Professor Rama Rao, of course, is very well known to us. Uh, he is an alumnus of ISC. He is a Padma Vibhushan very distinguished physical and mechanical metallurgist. Um, he joined IASC uh, in the Department of Metallurgy, then moved on to BHU, and uh, where he has, was on the faculty. He also had a long stint in the uh, in government laboratories like the DMRL, and was uh, Secretary of DST. Um, and he also also been on the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. He has a whole host of honors, which I will not uh, embarrass him by reading them out. All I can say is he's a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering, and he's a Padma Vibhushan. May I request Professor uh, Rama Rao to preside over the lecture. Professor Anurag Kumar, Professor Bhumesh Vashne, Professor Rahul Pandit, Pindu, and our speaker, Dr. Vishigesh Narayanan, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Satya Atluri <coughs> has a very distinguished academic career. He's a PhD from MIT, USA, and is at present <coughs> a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at uh, Texas Tech University. His interests <coughs> are in the following disciplinary areas. I've just chosen four, <coughs> computational mathematics. Essentially, the theoretical man, theoretical applied and computational mechanics of solids at various length scales and various time scales. Computer modeling in engineering and sciences, meshless and other novel methods in computing and co uh, computational methods. Structural long longevity and health management. As uh, uh, Umesh Vashne was mentioning, he was all over the place, been all over the place in the United States. He has sta started several well-known universities, MIT, Georgia Tech, California at Los Angeles, and also Calif University of California at Irvine. Above all, he's an alumnus of the University of Science, Bangalore, in the Aeronautics Department. I met him actually uh, <coughs> nearly three decades ago. One fine day in the afternoon, he dropped in at my office when I was directed to DMRL, absolutely from nowhere. I didn't even know where he came from. He just said that he wanted to have a chat with me. He had a good chat about various things. And I found him very knowledgeable about Indian science and Indian scientists, and to some extent, Indian politics. Ever since then, we have maintained contact, and this contact has been nurtured steadily and has grown. Even at this age of 73, Professor Atluri is one of the most hardworking researchers that uh, I have come across. His output is remarkable, prodigious. Hundreds of students and hundreds of publications. Many of his students have been Indian scholars. 
He's been wanting to do something to his alma mater, Indian Social Science at Bangalore, and the result is this uh, chair, Revati and Satyanatham chair for an associate professor, which has been awarded for the first time to a meritorious speaker this afternoon, Dr. Rishikesh Narayanan. For those of you who come from Andhra Pradesh, that uh, Natham may have uh, some interest. He's born in Gudiwada. Some of you may connect uh, with this place. The point to note is that it's not often that we come across academics, you know, <coughs> doling out substantial amounts of money to set up chairs. This chair cost him more than two crores. And if uh, I'm not wrong, the first chair to be set up at Institute of Science by a full-blown academic. Academics are not very rich people, as you know. They derive their pleasure from something else. He's a proud recipient of the civil and honor, Padma Bhushan, in the year 2003. In 2009, he, um, he, uh, 2009, he was inducted as a corresponding member of the Academy of uh, Athens, Greece, which is one of the oldest <coughs> academy of scientific and philosophical society in the modern world. So we have um, a very, uh, we can be proud of this uh, alumnus of Institute of Science and has also been a very generous hearted individual. So now I request Dr. Umesh Varnayan or Professor Vishnu to introduce the speaker. Thank you, sir. Uh, friends, it's a huge pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Rishi Kesh Nairanan, who is more properly known as Rishi. Rishi is actually son of the soil here, uh, and he really doesn't need much introduction. But to keep with the formality of the lecture, uh, let me just tell you some things about him. He did his undergraduate degree from Mapko Schlenk Engineering College, Shivakashi. Most of you know Shiv Karshi. Uh, this college is affiliated to Madurai Kamraj University. And subsequently, he joined ISC, where he did his MSc engineering with uh, Professor uh, Y.K. Venktesh. He then continued in the same laboratory to do his PhD uh, with uh, uh, Professor Y.V. Y. Y. Venktesh in 2002. He then moved to the neighboring institute, uh, NCBS, National Center for Biological Sciences, to do his first postdoc with uh, Shona Chatterjee. And then he moved to UT Austin to do a second postdoc uh, with Professor Daniel Johnston. He joined at ISC as faculty, assistant professor in 2009, and was then promoted to, 2015, uh, to associate prof professor in 2015. And he has really done outstanding work, which has also been recognized by many, many awards. His, uh, a recipient of Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Award, uh, is a senior fellow of Welcome Trust DBT and the Alliance, a very prestigious fellowship and the funding agency uh, to support research in the uh, laboratory. He's also a, a HFSP Career Development uh, Award holder and uh, he's received many, many fellowships from HFSP to carry out his research. It's no surprise that he actually competed extremely well uh, for this uh, uh, associate chair professor, which has been instituted at the institute uh, very recently. And Rishi is really the first recipient of this uh, 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 chair award lecture. So with those few words, now let me invite Rishi uh, uh, to deliver the first Levati and Satyan Adam Atluri uh, chair uh, award lecture. And the title of his lecture is shown over there, Dan Rice. Active trees in the brain. Rishi. Thanks. I'm Professor Kamara, Professor Anurag Kumar, and Professor Vashni. Uh, 
thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, having me. I would first like to thank um, uh, Professor uh, Satyanadam Atluri for uh, um, 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 being the donor for this particular chair. Uh, and I thank the committee members uh, for uh, selecting me as the first chairholder. Um, so the, the title of my talk is uh, uh, Dendrites Active Trees in the Brain. Now, I'd like to go um, step by step. Let's see where we get uh, as we go through. So I call my laboratory as um, the um, laboratory as the Cellular Neurophysiology Laboratory. The, there are several research themes associated with this. Um, So, so the, one of the main themes that we work on is degeneracy in the hippocampal formation. The second theme is active genetic physiology, and the third theme is um, calcium physiology and plasticity. Um, so the institute audience has uh, heard me speak about degeneracy in the hippocampal formation in, in recent times. So, so for this particular talk, I decided to pick this theme uh, for uh, uh, presentation over here. Uh, so I'll try to um, um, put together a broad overview of what we do in the laboratory within this particular theme over the past uh, five years. Uh, and broadly speaking, the techniques that we use um, are electrophysiology, mostly in vitro electrophysiology. We are trying to move into in vivo electrophysiology, imaging, calcium imaging mostly, and computational modeling. Uh, and the animal model that we focus on is on uh, um, rodents, basically. So broadly, I call it as the cellular neurophysiology laboratory because uh, we are interested in the function of the, the nervous system. Uh, and we focus on the cellular end of it, not at the molecular end of it, not at the systems end of it, not at the behavioral end of it, just like uh, any part of biology, you can have research uh, spanning multiple scales. Um, and in our laboratory, we, would, uh, we are trying to focus on the cellular aspects of it, basically. So there are several people who have contributed to um, these different uh, research uh, themes within the laboratory. What I'm presenting is a post-factor cluster, not necessarily a, a predetermined um, uh, cluster where people are um, put into specific clusters. It's just that uh, they self-organize into different clusters and uh, these are the set of people who have been working on um, these uh, different uh, aspects of um, 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 the laboratory, basically. So for today's lecture, as I mentioned, I would like to focus on um, active dendritic physiology. And I'll uh, explain what I mean by active and what I mean by dendrites as I progress, uh, because I thought uh, I should keep the, the talk much more um, uh, general in its aspects. So the word dendrites comes from the Greek word dendron, uh, which basically means tree. Right? So, so that's the name of the, um, this particular structure that we are going to be talking about. Uh, and as you can see, these are some of the dendritic structures that you observe in uh, the, the brain. Uh, so this is the famous Purkinje cell, and you see that uh, um, nice uh, arborization. So this is a cortical pyramidal cell. Uh, and you see that the, the cell body resembles a pyramid and therefore the name pyramidal cell basically. Right? So, so you have very different kinds of uh, uh, organization in terms of how these uh, dendrites are. Uh, and they look very similar to some of the trees that we see and therefore and the straightforward uh, nomenclature associated with them. So these are individual neurons. Uh, so and as most of us know, um, dendrites are the primary sites for receiving synaptic inputs from other neurons. Uh, and neurons, as you can see over here, exhibit heterogeneous um, arborization, uh, uh, very different. So if you have a typical pyramidal cell, the probability that you would see an arborization like this, which is for a Purkinje cell, uh, is going to be very um, low. I mean, unless you have some kind of major uh, uh, arborization deficit or something like that. Uh, so they have very typical organization, very typical um, uh, uh, patterns of branching and stuff. Historically, dendrites value where they are just uh, passing on food, uh, quote unquote, uh, to the neurons, uh, and they don't have any information processing um, uh, capabilities, basically. That was the idea. And there are two kinds, of, I mean, in this nomenclature, you can also call your, uh, dendrites to be passive, uh, where they don't have what are called as active components, which we will come in a minute. Uh, and they were thought to be as uh, simple funnels of information. So the idea was that uh, a single neuron will get around uh, 10 to 20,000 inputs, um, and you can't accommodate all of them into the cell body, so you need more surface area for accommodating these different inputs coming onto this particular structure. And therefore, you need this dendritic arborization, and therefore, uh, you have to have this kind of an arborization. So they were thought to be as uh, simple funnels of information, and they don't process any active uh, uh, processing uh, in those structures, basically. But active dendrites, on the other hand, uh, are those dendrites uh, which possess uh, active components such as what are called as voltage-gated ion channels. Uh, so these are um, protein molecules uh, 
which sit on the membrane and they allow specific kinds of ion to pass through either into the cell or outside the cell depending upon the transmembrane voltage. So if you put an electrode inside and if you put an electrode outside and measure this voltage difference. Uh, so that voltage difference is what is going to guide uh, what kind of ions are going to be passing through and whether the channel is going to be open or not. So it's going to be a voltage gated uh, ion channel. Uh, so these are active mechanisms because they are driven by um, the uh, passing across the structure and therefore they are called as active dendrites. So the, the dendrites that have these components uh, would be what are called as active dendrites. Uh, so the title of my lectures, which, which talks about uh, dendrites being active trees, uh, refers to uh, tree-like structures uh, which have these active components present in them, uh, and the active uh, uh, voltage gated ion channels present on them. So that's what the, letter, the lecture title may, refers to. So like uh, most neuroscience lectures, we will start with Ramoni Cajal, uh, who is easily considered the father of modern neuroscience. Uh, so he had, uh, based upon um, the, the neuronal structure that he looked through his microscope and drew, uh, very detailed diagrams of uh, some of this dendritic arborization, uh, he had come up with this idea of what is called as the law of dynamic polarization. So, so the idea is very simple from today's perspective. Uh, the idea is that you have these dendritic structures uh, which are receiving information from other neurons. Uh, and there is a cell body which is uh, um, a common connecting point uh, for various different dendrites that are reaching to this particular structure. Uh, and there is an axon, a single axon typically, which sends out information from this particular neuron to other neurons that will receive information from this neuron over here. And there is also an axonal initial segment. So the idea is that you will have these several inputs coming from other neurons, which are synapses like this from other neurons. Uh, they make contacts onto these particular dendrites. Uh, and information flows unidirectionally from the dendrites uh, to the cell body where if there is a certain, um, um, the, the voltage that reaches the cell body, if it, that reaches a certain threshold, uh, then this particular cell will fire an action potential, what's called as an action potential, which will traverse through this and go to other neurons over here. Right? So, so the idea is that uh, there is a kind of summation of information over here uh, and there is a threshold device uh, which is going to ask whether the voltage that is coming into this particular cell is going to be beyond a certain voltage threshold uh, and an action potential will be generated if that particular threshold is reached basically. Right? So, so it's a very simple um, functioning, uh, you have a simple idea of how a neuron functions. So there are two components to it. Uh, one, there is passive information flow. Two, um, it is going to be unidirectional flow of information and all the active processes is going to be taking place in the cell body over here. Right? So, so based on this, uh, so this is the common idea of uh, what we think a neuron does. Uh, so you have a bunch of uh, inputs coming from different neurons which are shown in uh, uh, blue over here. Uh, and it, it reaches over here with a certain weight depending upon the kind of structures that are present over there and the distance uh, between this point and here. Right? So if, this, uh, if there is an input that is coming over here, it has to traverse all this distance and therefore uh, the amount of information transferred is going to be lesser. On the other hand, if there is an input that is coming over here, you would have a much easier access to the cell body. And therefore, uh, this weight is going to be dependent upon what is present over here and this, um, this traversal of information along this particular structure. So based upon that, uh, we came up with this very simple idea based upon the law of dynamic polarization uh, that there is a summation device uh, which would weight all these inputs that are coming onto this particular structure. Uh, and this threshold device is going to um, ask whether it crosses a certain threshold and then send an output uh, based upon what kind of inputs are coming over here. So that was the idea and uh, at that stage because we did not have the technical advance, uh, advancement of uh, recording from these structures. Uh, so these are like two micron in diameter. Uh, so it's very difficult to record from these structures and uh, uh, unless you have like visually guided electrophysiological recording techniques, uh, it's extremely difficult to record from these structures basically. So as a consequence, it was assumed without uh, appropriate experimental backing and data that this was going to be completely passive uh, and it is just going to be collecting information and feeding into this particular structure, which is the main computational device uh, uh, which sets the threshold over here. Right? So, so however, um, if you look at research over the past two decades uh, mostly, uh, people started recording from this dendritic structure because uh, the patch clump electrophysiology technique uh, came to a point uh, where you were capable of uh, looking at these dendritic structures uh, and recording from these thin dendritic structures that are present over there. And therefore, they were able to ask specific questions uh, as to whether these dendritic um, uh, structures do have ion channels uh, 
and whether they are indeed passive, as the assumption was at that point of time, uh, whether these are indeed passive uh, and things like that. Those questions were posed, uh, and it turned out uh, that uh, these dendritic structures are not really passive, uh, and they have several of these transmembrane proteins, which are ion channels that are present over there, uh, which exist through here. So it's not something like a funnel. So it's like a funnel that is passing information from several different neurons onto the structure. But here you would see that uh, because of this active structures that are present over here, you will have significant amount of processing that happens even here before it reaches the cell body. So now the, 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 con the complexity of uh, this particular computational device uh, increases manifold for the simple reason that now you have uh, processing happening at each and every of these locations, uh, not necessarily only at the cell body, basically. Right? So, so that changed the, the scenario of what exactly uh, dendritic structures are and what they are capable of, basically. But the question is, I mean, if, if, if something is stupid, then evolution would have thrown it uh, a long time ago. So, so the question to ask is, why do neural systems spend so much energy in placing these active mechanisms in dendrites? Uh, right? so, so you have these several different uh, uh, ion channels that are present over here. Uh, so it takes a lot of energy for uh, uh, the neuronal structure to transport these uh, ion channels into these dendrites and place them over there. So why does it spend so much energy for putting it over there? Uh, and what are the basic implications for the presence of these active dendrites uh, for neuronal physiology and information processing? So that has been the question that, uh, that has uh, um, been central to um, active dendritic literature and this part of uh, my laboratory's work uh, also focuses on this. Uh, some of the well-established implications for the presence of active dendrites are uh, two. One is that uh, um, action potentials which are generated at the cell body can propagate back into the dendrites. Uh, so, and, uh, and the second is that uh, the cell body is not the only place where you can initiate spikes, basically. Right? So, so at that point of time, we, we thought that because of the law of dynamic polarization, we assumed that uh, information is going to flow from here into the cell body, and there is never information flow from here into the dendritic structure. So this particular paper, uh, which is the landmark uh, uh, paper which actually showed that uh, there is back propagation of uh, action potential into the dendrites, uh, showed for the first time unequivocally that uh, uh, you do have information going back and forth. Uh, it's not unidirectional flow of information A. And second thing is that uh, because you have these channels that are present over here, even in the in the dendrites, uh, so you have sodium channels present over here which are responsible for the generation of action potential that we saw earlier. So now if they are present even on the dendrites, uh, you can have uh, um, spikes initiated even at the dendritic locations. Uh, you don't have to have uh, the somatic location as the only point where you have spike initiation. Right? So, so those two became very clear um, because of this. So this is the first paper which showed that uh, there is back propagation of um, action potential. And this is one of the several papers uh, that showed that even these uh, thin structures that are present over here are capable of this nonlinearity that is shown over here. So until a certain point, it is kind of linear. Beyond that, you have uh, um, these dendritic spikes, as they are called as, uh, initiated even the, in these smaller dendritic structures, uh, as a consequence of which you have these kind of things. So those are some of the um, existing examples of where dendrites or active dendrites have a role to play. Uh, so as a consequence of that, now if you have to think of a neuron, um, instead of uh, the traditional approach of what we treat neurons as simple algebraic summation units, so these dendritic structures are just algebraically summing the inputs, there are excitatory inputs, there are inhibitory inputs, uh, you sum up the sum them up and you have a nonlinearity that is present over here. Uh, now this is being replaced by this particular structure where the dendrite is not passive anymore, it's active, and the information flow is not something which is unidirectional. You have bidirectional flow of information and there is coincidence of inputs. I mean, signals that are coming from this side and signals that are coming from that side. Uh, therefore, the complexity associated with what is happening within a single neuron is much more than what you would have had uh, with this kind of an algebraic summation unit over here. Right? So, so, so these are some of the implications for, for the presence of active dendrites. Uh, so what we have been doing in our laboratory is, uh, is looking at uh, the, the several scales of analysis uh, uh, that you see over here. Um, so just like any other field of biology, uh, neuroscience also proceeds in several scales of analysis. So you could look at systems at the behavioral level. Uh, or you could look at things at the genetic level or systems level, say visual systems and auditory systems and so on and so forth. Uh, and as I said, uh, um, the main focus of our lab has been at the cellular end of it. Uh, and we dabble into networks and into uh, the molecular side of it a little bit, uh, but uh, it's all centered at the cellular end of it. Uh, 
So I thought I'll start with uh, um, some of the things that we have found over the past uh, um, five years, uh, mostly. Uh, I'll start at the cellular end, uh, then jump to the network end, and jump back to the molecular end and stop it at that. Uh, so for each of these uh, different scales, I'll try to give uh, two different examples of where we found uh, active dendrites to be useful uh, or uh, creating a, a sig significant difference. Uh, so the first one I would like to talk about is uh, a frequency selectivity in, uh, in neurons. Uh, so if you look at uh, neurons uh, and record from them, so what you're doing over here is uh, you are injecting a certain current uh, and you're recording the voltage from this particular structure. Right? So, so this is a current uh, which is uh, going to be of constant amplitude, uh, but it has various different frequencies over here. So the idea is to find how exactly this particular neuron is going to respond uh, for these different frequencies uh, when you feed constant amplitude signals into this. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, this is a hippocampal recording, and you observe that uh, the, 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 um, the response, the voltage response to this particular current uh, is maximal at this particular location, and it's minimal on both sides. Uh, so if you take this envelope uh, and plot this over here, uh, so this gives you the frequency response properties of this particular neuron over here. So it turns out uh, that this particular neuron is, uh, is a resonating neuron, uh, and it has a bandpass structure where it has a very, I mean, um, optimal frequency to which it responds to, which is also called as the resonance frequency. And this is how you would record this. You inject this current into the neuron and record this voltage, uh, and you get this um, envelope, and you find out at what frequency does it maximally respond. Uh, and that is what is the maximal response frequency associated with that particular neuron. Right? So, so now if you look at, and, uh, look at this and ask the mechanisms behind this, uh, what are the mechanisms associated with this uh, frequency response properties. So you can ask that question in two, di two different ways. Uh, one is by um, uh, pharmacological techniques. Uh, what you do is you take a normal uh, kind of cell, I mean, which responds like this, uh, and you treat it with, uh, with the pharmacological agent, uh, which blocks this, what is called as the HCN channel. So this is the pacemaker channel. This plays a very critical role in uh, pacemaking in the heart as well. Um, and it has implications for uh, oscillations in the brain as well. Right? So, so you look at this and you block this particular channel um, and you observe that the frequency selectivity is now gone. Right? So what used to be a bandpass structure now becomes a low pass structure once you have this uh, blocker in the back vesicle. Or alternately, what you can do is uh, you can find out the kinetics associated with this particular channel and introduce that into a simulation. So you have a model for a neuron without this channel, without this particular channel over here, uh, and you measure the frequency response properties, uh, introduce this channel, and repeat the same thing. So here it is zero, here it is something else, uh, and you see that again there is the emergence of this. Uh, right? so, so these two together show necessity and sufficiency of, uh, of this particular channel uh, in bringing about uh, um, uh, frequency response properties in these kinds of uh, neuronal structure, and as it turns out, uh, if you increase the conductance of this particular, if the density of expression of this particular channel increases uh, on the x-axis, uh, the resonance frequency, the frequency at which it maximally responds, uh, also increases uh, monotonically. Right? So, so now, I give you, if, if I give you this, and I also tell you that uh, the, the density of these channels uh, is not something which is constant across the dendritic structure, uh, but it increases in hippocampal neurons and in cortical neurons, uh, if you measure the density of these neuron, these channels as a function of distance from the cell body, you see that there is an increase over here, right? So, so if I give you these two slides, uh, you would obviously predict that. So there is a non, a non monotonically increasing function of um, of resonance frequency versus the the density of these channels, uh, and as a function of distance, uh, this is monotonically increasing. So you would predict um, that as the distance um, changes uh, from the cell body you would see that the resonance frequency also increases over here. Right? So that's what you would predict. Uh, and that's what happens. So if you experimentally test this uh, by actually recording from these cell balls, these, uh, these dendritic structures uh, at different locations, uh, you see that uh, there is an increase in the resonance frequency. Uh, at the cell body, it's on the order of at different voltages. Uh, and this is around four hertz. Uh, on the other hand, this is around nine hertz over here. Right? So, so you have a system, you have a neuron which is not responding to the same frequency uh, optimally at all locations, uh, but depending upon which location the input is coming on to, you have different frequency response properties over here. Right? So, so that's the consequence of the presence of active dendrites. Uh, and you have uh, these different locations now having very different resonance frequency, and therefore, they would filter signals uh, very differently when they come onto this particular structure. 
So this is all with reference to in signals that uh, are below threshold, where you are not generating any action potential, um, you are not recruiting any of the um, action potential generating mechanisms. Uh. But now if you want to ask the same question as to whether you have this kind of a frequency response property in, um, in uh, um, action potential generation as well, uh, you um, employ a construct that is called as the spike triggered average. Um, so this is a very old concept uh, which has been used for, uh, I mean, uh, um, more than uh, um, yeah, almost a century, I would think, uh, um, for understanding neurons, basically. So the idea is that you try to find out what the average stimulus uh, is for a neuron to trigger a spike, basically. Right? So, so what is shown over here is the typical um, STA, as it is called, a spike-triggered average. Uh, so you have, uh, um, this is the point at which the spike came in. Um, so what this particular structure shows uh, is, uh, that, I mean, if there is an input uh, that comes at this particular point over here, uh, then that is going to have a large probability in eliciting a spike. It should be a large input, uh, right? And it also tells you that the inputs that come within this window, which is called, uh, which is also called as the coincidence detection window, you have uh, um, um, that particular region is going to maximally contribute to the spike over here, right? So, and if there is an excitatory input or if there is a positive input that comes within this region, that is going to negatively contribute to the generation of spike, right? So that's the, the general uh, idea for this one. I don't know where uh, um, the rest of the sentence went. Uh, so it should read as a single STA is sufficient to uh, characterize a single neuron. Uh, so now what you do is you take this uh, particular uh, um, STA, which is uh, uh, telling you what exactly is the, um, is the, um, the average stimulus that elicits the spike. Uh, find the Fourier, Fourier transform of this. Uh, so this tells you what frequencies this particular thing is responsive to. So, so this is the stimulus that is going to maximally elicit a response in terms of spike generation. Now, uh, you ask what is the frequency response characteristics of this. Uh, this one also shows bandpass characteristics. Uh, you find that particular frequency. And what Anandita showed uh, was that uh, even for, so this is what I showed with, uh, with resonance. Uh, where we injected chirp current and measured this uh, frequency response characteristic. Uh, here we use a system identification uh, um, uh, technique, which is kind of popular in, uh, in, in neuroscience. Uh, so we have uh, um, these spikes over here. And here also, what Anandita found was uh, uh, you have uh, an increase in the frequency um, for distal dendritic locations compared to the cell body over here. Right? So, so this tells you um, that the, the frequency preference or the the, the, the specific frequencies that a neuron is uh, responsive to maximally is dependent upon where exactly the inputs come in, uh, and it is critically dependent upon the kind of uh, ion channels that are expressed over here. So the, the, the prevalent dogma, which should have come in the previous slide also, uh, is um, that a single STA is adequate to characterize neuronal spiking, uh, because I mean, typically you would just have one particular STA, and that would define uh, uh, the entire neuron. But because of this analysis, uh, which shows that uh, the STA is something which is dependent upon location because of the presence of active dendrites, uh, you will have to have uh, a location dependent STA kernel filter uh, instead of having a single filter for everything that comes on to a single nonlinearity over here. Right? So, so this is one of the implications for the presence of that. Uh, the second part in the cellular scale is uh, Reshma's work uh, on uh, um, place field tuning. Uh, uh, so as you are aware, uh, so the, the hippocampal formation, which is uh, a dominant structure in, uh, in uh, the mammalian brain, uh, rodents and, uh, and humans, uh, is uh, critically involved in, uh, in spatial navigation. So if you record from uh, a cell in the hippocampus, uh, so this is uh, um, the firing rate associated with that particular cell. And these uh, wiggly lines over here are uh, uh, the movement of a rat in this particular arena over here. Right? Uh, and these red dots uh, correspond to um, action potential being, spy, being recorded from that single cell that you are recording from, right? So, so as, you, as the rat uh, moves around over here, you see that certain parts of this, uh, this structure doesn't have many spikes, uh, but as soon as the animal reaches one particular place cell location, one particular location over here, it elicits maximal number of spikes. Uh, and you also see that if you calculate the firing rate of that particular neuron, it is highest at that particular location. So these are what are called as uh, place cells. Uh, uh, they are present in the hippocampus, and the Nobel was uh, awarded for both place cell and for grid cells. Uh, so the grid cells are uh, in the entorhinal cortex, and they have a grid-like pattern, uh, which we will not talk about. Uh, 
So, so now um, the question that Reshma asked uh, was with reference to these play cell uh, uh, firing over here. So, so if the animal instead of running in this uh, two dimensional arena, if you have uh, the animal running in a one dimensional arena, you will have the place field emerging like this. Uh, so within that particular place field, uh, you will have a large firing rate uh, and on either side of it, you will have the, the cell not firing basically. Right? So, so the question that, uh, Re that Reshma posed was uh, whether dispersed synapses could yield uh, uh, sharp place cell tuning uh, with the dendritic spike initiation. Let me explain that, uh, that title over there. Right? So, so, um, so you have, uh, um, so this is a single neuron, right? Uh, and you have uh, the inputs from this particular place field as the animal traverses through this particular place field, uh, the inputs that are coming from that particular location, from the, the presynaptic part of it, uh, could uh, come onto this particular neuron at different locations. It could all be at the cell body. It could be clustered uh, in one particular uh, dendritic structure. It could be clustered on two different dendritic structure or it could be dispersed all over the place basically, right? So, so the prevalent dogma in the field uh, uh, at that time was, uh, or even now, is that uh, you need to have synapses to be clustered like this, uh, where they come and impinge on a single dendritic branch over here for you to be able to get dendritic spike uh, and sharp tuning of this particular place field uh, uh, firing over here, right? So, so what uh, Reshma asked was whether you could get uh, uh, sharp tuning as well as dendritic spiking with, uh, with uh, uh, dispersed synaptic inputs where she randomly distributed these inputs uh, throughout the entire dendritic arbor. There was no uh, specific localization or anything like that. And she also ensured that uh, there was not many um, inputs which are close by to each other. So what she found out was surprising, right? So, so if you had all the synapses coming onto the cell body, then I mean, it's all on the cell body and therefore you have a sharp tuning over here. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, what we expected to find was uh, if you have it on a single oblique or in two obliques, uh, because of the generation of dendritic spikes, you will have a sharp tuning. Uh, in contrast, what we found was that it was flat, right? So compared to what you see over here, you see that the firing rates are lower and you have a much more uh, shallow tuning of, uh, of place over here. Uh, and even more surprisingly, when we looked at the, um, the, the structure where um, we had dispersed inputs, where it was all randomly distributed, uh, we had sharp tuning, which was very similar to what we got with uh, somatic structures, basically. Right? So, so then she went into uh, probing the, the mechanisms behind what exactly could be leading to this. Uh, and she found that uh, in these structures, uh, where you have uh, um, dispersed synaptic inputs, uh, you still had dendritic spikes. Uh, so these are the color codes. And you see that in this particular case, uh, you have the, um, the black action potential coming um, um, much after these different things that are coming first. Uh, so this is a dendritic spike uh, that eventually leads to a full-blown action potential, showing that even with dispersed synaptic inputs over here, you can get uh, dendritic spikes. And that is what led to the sharp tuning because uh, when she blocked the dendritic sodium channels, uh, which are responsible for this, uh, for this dendritic spikes, uh, if you block the dendritic sodium channels, you will get only somatic action potentials uh, and not anything else. Uh, and you see that uh, there is a significant reduction in the tuning over here. Right? So, so that significant reduction then in tuning is because you don't have any dendritic spikes. Uh, so what she showed was uh, you can get dendritic spikes with dispersed synaptic inputs and that will lead to um, sharp feature tuning over here. Uh, so she showed that that is because of the presence of active dendrites. Uh, without this, uh, you don't get that sharp tuning over here. Right? So it's very important to have that um, kind of a structure. So then we will jump from the cellular end of it to the network end of it. Um, so um, at the network end of it, what we look at um, are interactions across cells. Um, so you are talking about how exactly different cells are coming together to bring about a certain phenomenon, right? So that's the question that we are asking. So I'm going to show you two different examples. Uh, one is about um, uh, ensemble recordings uh, from neurons uh, where uh, these signals are generated by combinations of several different neurons uh, spiking or getting inputs at the same time. Uh, that's one kind of thing. Uh, and in the second part of it, I'm going to talk about interactions between neurons uh, and what are called as astrocytes. So these are other kinds of cells that are present in, these, uh, in the brain. Uh, and how they interact with each other, right? So, so the first part of the work was done by um, Manisha. Um, so you have, uh, so these are some of the electrophysiological recordings that you can get uh, uh, from, um, uh, from the brain. Uh, and these have been uh, used uh, both from the perspective of scientific research and for clinical diagnosis. Uh, 
So there are several different things. This is the ancillography, and you have local field potentials and extracellular action potentials and so on and so forth. Uh, and you also have intracellular action potential, which is the kind that I was showing you um, so far. Right? So, so let's focus on these extracellular field potentials. Um, and if you record from, from these kinds of uh, um, neuronal populations, uh, you will get signals like this, uh, which are kind of oscillating. Uh, and you will have this sharp uh, um, spike-like structure, which are actually spikes uh, from different neurons that are present. Now you take the signal uh, and filter it into two parts. Uh, the first part where you are um, passing it through a structure where you have uh, only frequencies lesser than 500 hertz. Uh, and that's called as the lo local field potential. And you also have pass it through a high pass filter to get this uh, spike-like structure. Um, and that will give you um, the spikes from multiple different neurons over here. So this is uh, the kind of thing. And you will have some electrode that passes through this. Uh, and you will record from different neurons. So this uh, recording that you are observing over here is not a consequence of a single neuron. Uh, it's a consequence of multiple neurons uh, sending their signals uh, to this particular electrode over here. Right? So, so um, Again, the prevalent dogma over here uh, was uh, that uh, you have uh, um, the LFPs uh, reflect synaptic inputs because there was nothing else present over here. And therefore, if you put an extracellular field electrode over here, uh, this should reflect the synaptic inputs that are coming onto this particular structure. Um, on the other hand, with this uh, new realization that there are these dendritic uh, ion channels, uh, now it stands to reason that if you put an electrode over here, this is not going to be something which is just reflective of the synaptic currents, uh, but it is also going to be reflective of the ion channels that are present on this particular dynamic structure. So that was the, the, um, the, the, the hypothesis that uh, Manisha started her uh, uh, research with. Uh, and these are uh, um, um, the LFPs that he got, I mean, have from, from different locations. Uh, and uh, she also got uh, these uh, spikes for individual neurons. Uh, so you see that that's the local field potential, uh, um, and you have these spikes. Uh, and you see that they have a preference uh, for a specific phase over here. Right? So around zero degrees is where they prefer to spike. Uh, and that's the kind of response that they get. Uh, now she has the system. Uh, and therefore, what she did was uh, she introduced the same uh, pacemaker channel that we were talking about, uh, the HCN channels. Uh, and asked what exactly happens to the phase of the LFP. Right? So, so this LFP itself is an oscillation, and therefore it can shift this side and that side. Uh, and as a consequence of um, um, the HCN channel acting in a certain way, you see that there is a phase shift uh, in the, the um, LFP itself. That is number one. Uh, and number two, when she added these, uh, these channels over here, you see that the spikes became much more coherent. Right? So, Instead of being all over the place over here, like what it is um, uh, here, uh, you see that um, the spikes become much more coherent. And they start spiking uh, only with reference to one particular phase uh, when the HCN channel density was higher in this kind of a scenario. And finally, she also showed that uh, the spike phases also were different um, because of the presence of HCN channel. And they showed it for different kinds of densities over here. Right? So, so now, what she has shown is that uh, the LFPs that you get uh, are not necessarily just reflections of uh, the synaptic currents that are coming from here. They are reflections of A, the, um, the synaptic currents, uh, and B, the ionic currents that are um, being activated as a consequence of the synaptic activation that is present over there. Right? So, so she brought in uh, a new dimension of complexity into the whole thing, uh, questioning in some senses, uh, in all senses, uh, the, um, the prevalent dogma that it was purely synaptic. Uh, Second part of it is with reference to um, the interactions between um, uh, neurons and astrocytes. Uh, so this is one of uh, Ramoni Cajal's diagrams. Um, and here, uh, you see that there is this neuron, and there is this um, uh, astrocyte, uh, which sends its processes um, and it kind of engulfs uh, this entire cell body over here. Right? So, so these are more modern uh, techniques used to understand the interactions between neurons uh, and astrocytes, neuron, astrocyte. Um, so this is the postsynaptic side, this is the presynaptic side, and there is an astrocyte that is present over here. Uh, so if you look at these kinds of diagrams much more closely, you um, realize that it's not just uh, a presynaptic structure, which is releasing a neurotransmitter, and a postsynaptic structure, which is getting these neurotransmitters. Uh, but there is also a third component which is present, uh, which is the astrocyte, uh, which is another cell type, uh, which doesn't fire action potential, that surrounds it. right? Uh, and it has been known for some time uh, that you can have uh, these astrocytes uh, release uh, certain active molecules, uh, 
which can go and bind onto these receptors that are present either on the presynaptic side or on the postsynaptic side, uh, eliciting large currents over here. Right? So, so um, this is one of such recordings which was uh, uh, from another group, uh, which showed that if you record from the cell body of these neurons that are present over here on the postsynaptic side, uh, you have these huge currents um, that come up uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, they're pretty large amplitude, even on the cell body, they are like 100 picoamperes, uh, and pretty broad in terms of uh, how long they last, basically. Right? So, but what was not known was uh, how exactly um, does the impact of gliotransmission uh, affect the dendrites? Right? So, so because all the synapses come and make contact onto the dendrites, uh, so now without knowing how exactly the gliotransmission uh, is going to affect the dendrites, uh, you can't make specific statements about how they are going to interact with the inputs that are coming from other neurons. Uh, so we did not know the mapping of this, uh, and we did not know if uh, the presence of active dendritic conductances uh, um, affect the strength and spread of this particular impact over here. So Sufyan uh, 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 did these heroic experiments because these are like extremely difficult experiments. Uh, A, patching onto dendrites is extremely difficult, and B, patching onto astrocytes, uh, which are also uh, smaller in diameter with reference to the cellular uh, diameter of neurons. Uh, that's also difficult. Uh, he did both of them together, um, and he showed that uh, uh, at the cell body you have smaller signals. Uh, so this is at the cell body, and you see that there are smaller signals over here. As you go up into the dendrite, uh, you start seeing these large amplitude signals, uh, which are on the order of 20, 30 millivolts. Uh, so these are not because of synaptic inputs, because you don't have any um, active transmission. You have blocked the sodium channels. Uh, so, and he showed that uh, this was consistently the case uh, across different uh, structures, basically. Then he did another set of experiments just to show that uh, these signals that he is recording is indeed from astrocyte and not from somewhere else. Uh, so, for that, again, this is a bunch of set of, bunch of uh, um, much more difficult experiment because you have to patch a neuron and then uh, patch another astrocyte, uh, um, um, which is close by so that it has some kind of contact with this. Uh, so he passed on to a neuron and then waited for a certain period of time where he recorded these signals uh, and then patched the, the astrocyte uh, with something that would release the gliotransmitters from there. Uh, so and he showed, uh, so this is the, I mean, the dramatic difference that you observe before and after, right? So, so this is before and you see that these signals are extremely small. Uh, on the other hand, after you activate uh, gliotransmission from the astrocytes, uh, you see that uh, the signals are much more larger much more wider, and they last for long enough. Uh, and he showed that it, it um, was consistent across different locations uh, um, and different uh, recordings. Uh. And then he didn't stop there. He also asked whether the kind of channels that are present in the dendrites, uh, do they have any effect on uh, um, amplitude and the kinetics associated with that? Uh, he looked at two different channels. One is the pacemaker channel that I have been talking about, uh, another is the transient potassium channel, which I did not talk about, but they are also present in the dendrites. And he showed that, uh, he showed that uh, both these ion channels, which are present on the dendrites, uh, had a significant effect uh, on either the amplitude or the kinetics, or both of them, uh, uh, when you had uh, the blocker for that particular channel over here. So he took this data to a computational model, uh, and he asked whether the spread of this particular uh, uh, glide transmission impact, that is also affected by these different channels. Uh, and he again showed that there is a significant effect of both the the pacemaker channel as well as the transient potassium channel when they are present in the dendrite fashion. Right? So, so here he um, looked at how exactly an astrocyte, uh, which is a different kind of cell type, interacts with the neuron and how that impact is being altered uh, by the presence of active dendritic structures uh, in the neuron um, um, that are uh, shown over in the, in the neuron at the location of the arrival, not necessarily at the cell body. So, so far the recordings were concentrated on the cell body. Uh, what Sufyan did was uh, he took the electrode into the dendrite uh, and asked more uh, detailed questions about this. Uh, moving from here to here, um, so as I said, um, um, we also look into um, what happens at the subcellular end of it uh, as to what kind of molecules and, uh, and the signaling mechanisms are present and how they spread and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is also Sufyan's work, uh, so this is about uh, intraneuronal calcium waves uh, that are present. Uh, so you can measure propagation of uh, signals uh, in a neuron, and let's say that this is the point of origin. Uh, it could be either voltage or calcium, uh, and you can, have, you can measure how exactly it is spreading across the dynamic structure on either side. Uh, and you can model it as an exponential, and you can fit an exponential 
and you can call this point um, at which it reaches 37 percentages lambda basically right so so there is a significant difference between voltage propagation and calcium propagation in neurons um, right so so if you measure voltage propagation and you plot the value of this lambda that's on the order of uh, hundreds of microns uh, but for calcium it is less than a micron it doesn't spread at all in neurons uh, it is very very localized um, it's like on the order of 1 micron and uh, that turns out to be an extremely crucial thing for uh, um, maintaining uh, um, localized plasticity and things like that. That's an extremely crucial number. Uh, if this spreads beyond this, uh, then pretty much hell will break loose, basically. Right? So, so it's very important that this remains uh, uh, close by. But there are active mechanisms which can uh, ensure that the calcium can propagate uh, to a longer distance, basically. Right? So, so what we have been talking about so far is about the plasma membrane, where you have these different kinds of receptors. Uh, and channels, we have been act, uh, talking about what exactly is the impact of these channels uh, on neuronal physiology. But there is another membrane that is present within the neuron. It's like a network within the network. Uh, so it's called as the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so endo means inside, plasmic means the plasma membrane, and reticulum is the network. Uh, so it's a network that is present within the entire uh, neuron. And the ER, as it is called as, as it is abbreviated as, uh, goes wherever the neuron goes. Uh, I mean, it, it, it goes into the thinnest possible structures, uh, and they are present over there. And there also you have these different kinds of channels. Uh, so one kind of channel that is present over there is what is uh, this one, this one, which is the IP3 receptor, uh, which is a calcium channel, basically. So what uh, Sufyan asked in this question, I mean, I'll, I'll come to that. So he was interested in asking how exactly these structures interact with each other in an active dendritic structure. Right? So, so this is about um, um, propagation of calcium waves, uh, right? So, so you have these, uh, uh, so that the, 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 the plasma membrane is somewhere out there. Uh, so this is the ER. And you have this IP3 receptors, let's say, right? Uh, and when calcium is released uh, in only a subset of this, uh, it will just lead to a localized increase, and it doesn't propagate, basically, right? So and even if there is a bunch of them, then it doesn't have any propagation. Uh, but because of the characteristics of this receptor, which is also dependent upon the cytosolic, I mean the, the calcium concentration, if there is a certain threshold reached, uh, it can start propagating as a wave, basically. So it's actively propagated, uh, mediated by these IP3 receptors that are present over there. And if there are gap junctions present here, they can become intercellular waves and go to the next stage as well. Right? So, so uh, in neurons also have these kinds of calcium waves, uh, and you can. Um, uh, record them by um, initiating spikes in the presence of uh, a metabotropic glutamate receptor agonist. Let's not go into the details. Uh, but you can get calcium waves which propagate from somewhere here throughout the entire structure. So that's a chymograph I will explain to you in the next slide. So what Sufyan was interested uh, was in asking uh, how exactly these two membranes interact with each other. So we have been now talking about uh, only how this particular membrane and the kinds of components that are present over there interact with each other. He wanted to take you to the next step uh, and ask questions about how this particular um, um, membrane and this membrane would interact with each other to bring about um, um, neuronal physiology. That was the question that he was interested in. Uh, so this is uh, uh, how it will look like. So, so if you do the same thing, uh, you see that there are, in the, the absence of high concentration of IP3 in the cytosol, uh, you see that uh, the, the concentration of calcium is very low. On the other hand, if you have a larger concentration of uh, IP3 within the cytosol, it becomes a wave and it lasts for a larger period of time. And you see that the numbers are also very different over here. Right? So and this is a chymograph. Uh, a chymograph is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, plotting technique where you put time on one axis and space on another axis. Uh, so this is space uh, which corresponds to this particular thing uh, along the trunk over here. And this is time on the x-axis. And you see that uh, the calcium wave initiates over here and propagates into the dendrite and into the soma over here. Right? So, so he had this calcium waves. Uh, now he was interested in asking about um, asking questions about how exactly this potassium channel would affect uh, the the calcium wave. So, so this is how the calcium wave looked like uh, uh, under normal conditions. When he changed the potassium channel concentrations, uh, he observed that uh, the wave started looking very different. Uh, there was a latency in terms of when exactly it peaked. Uh, the amplitude was lower as he increased the density of this particular uh, uh, channel. Uh, so there was a significant effect uh, of uh, um, the, the presence of active dendritic channels, in this case, uh, the A-type potassium channel on uh, calcium wave uh, propagation in this kind of a system. Right? So, so that is about calcium wave. And finally, um, 
Calcium is uh, just the first step uh, in triggering the downstream signaling cascades. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's the one that triggers several other things which would eventually lead to adaptation or changes in the neuron um, for bringing about whatever form of plasticity in neurons, basically, right? So, so, so we wanted to go um, to the next step below um, uh, calcium over here. Uh, so this is one of the uh, standard uh, uh, pathways which, are, which has been implicated in, uh, in uh, um, neuronal plasticity, right? So, so this is a kinase, uh, so it's just an enzyme for now. Um, and this enzyme would go and, uh, I mean, when it uh, is binds onto calcium along with calmodulin over here, uh, so you would see that uh, that leads to, um, I mean, what is known as phosphorylation, and this can go and uh, change the different channels that are present over here, right? So, so what Reshma did uh, was um, uh, she uh, was interested in looking at what happens downstream of calcium, right? So what we saw in the previous, uh, um, uh, study, which was uh, Sufyan's, uh, was what exactly happened to the calcium when the ER also was involved. Uh, what Reshma was interested in asking was, uh, we know that uh, the calcium spread is, uh, is, uh, is going to be minimal, uh, but what happens to a downstream molecules uh, when it comes over here to phosphorylated CAMK2, how does it look like, uh, how does the signal propagation occur, and whether active dendrites do play a role over here. So this is the calcium spread. Uh, and this is like 50 microns on each side. Um, and you can see that at this point, it's like three or four micromolar, but it falls pretty sharply. Uh, so this is a chymograph again. Uh, and you see that it's very, very localized uh, to the, um, the central part. Uh, but if you look at the spread of um, uh, the phosphorylated CAMK2, you see that that is much more wider than what you see over here because of how the, the on and off mechanisms work with that. So what Reshma asked was, uh, she took the, um, the, the same channel in this case uh, and asked questions about how exactly the peak calcium would change, uh, how exactly the area under the curve for this one, which is the, the area under this curve, uh, and the peak of this uh, and the area under this curve would change uh, with increases in this particular channel density over here. Right? So, and she showed that in this particular channel type, uh, you see that there is a suppression of uh, the spread in all cases. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you have T-type calcium channels, uh, you have an enhancement uh, of uh, these different things that you observe over here. Uh, and so she concluded that the presence of active dendritic structures uh, would significantly alter the spread of these downstream molecules uh, by indirectly affecting the second molecule, second messenger that is present uh, in this particular structure. Right? So, so, um, so, so we showed that, I mean, thus far, if you look at any of the the signaling microdomains papers within the literature, uh, you would see that they would use active and um, passive dendritic structures uh, which don't have any of this active components. Uh, and therefore, they wouldn't have been able to understand the implications for active dendrites which are present over there. Uh, right? So, so um, that's what Reshma showed. Uh, so to uh, conclude, uh, I would like to, I mean, just put this slide up and show that uh, the presence of active dendrites imply that old models of neuronal function uh, need significant revisions. Uh, and neurons are complex computational devices uh, and not simple algebraic units. Uh. And as we saw, if you include like uh, calcium and uh, signaling microdomains, uh, uh, so they are on the order of microns, uh, which means that uh, each of these individual points is uh, an independent computational device, uh, which is capable of making decision for its own uh, and not something which is uh, going to be talking with each other. Uh, and therefore, you will have to account for these complexities that are present within a single neuron if you are interested in understanding uh, how it processes information. To go with this old model would be foolhardy. Um, and, um, um, and I showed you some illustrative examples of work from the lab, uh, uh, which uh, uh, showed a central role in, for active dendrites in, uh, in brain physiology. And it spans several different scales of analysis. Uh, and people are also trying to look at uh, the implications of active dendrites and uh, how they, uh, they could change behavior and systems level uh, computations as well. Uh, we don't do that in our lab. Uh, we confine ourselves to this part of it. Uh, so those are the examples that I um, gave you, basically. Um, and these are the people who did the work. I did not do any of the work. Uh, so I was able to show only um, work by four different people. Uh, and uh, the others uh, also have worked on dendritic structures. Uh, and those are the different uh, uh, funding agencies which have, um, which have contributed to um, work in the laboratory, basically. Yeah. So I'd just like to stop there and stay tuned. Yeah.
Uh, but I was just wondering, I mean, are there, for instance, um, genetic or other disorders in which, let us say, the dendrites are insufficiently populated by uh, um, uh, channels or whatever it is, as a result of which some pathology comes out? I mean, uh, more than looking at it from a pathophysiological standpoint, people have started looking at it from a physiological standpoint okay. itself. Uh, so people have been able to um, make like uh, uh, drill holes into the, into the skulls of rodents, not humans, <laughs> and image uh, um, these dendritic structures. Uh, as the animal is doing certain behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, they have been asking questions about uh, the whiskers, which are one of the most important uh, uh, I mean sensing devices for, uh, for rodents. Uh, they have been asking questions mm -hmm. about how exactly when you, I mean, move certain whiskers, uh, um, whiskers what exactly happens to the dendritic uh, um, 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 signals? Uh, what exactly happens when you present specific orientations uh, to the eye, mm. uh, in the neurons in the visual cortex, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they have also, uh, those are observational, I mean science observational versus interventional. Uh, so they have also been intervening with it. Uh, so what they do is they express specific kinds of uh, uh, receptors which can be activated by uh, light. Right. Uh, and they can inhibit only the dendritic portion <coughs> associated with it instead of uh, uh, inhibiting the entire neuron. Uh, so they just shine light in that particular region and inhibit it. Uh, at, let the animal perform the same behavior um, when uh, the light is not shown, and let the animal uh, perform the same behavior when the light is shown. Uh, and ask questions about what would happen when you specifically impair only the dendritic function, right? So, so those are the kinds of questions that people have been asking, and uh, and there have been both correlational and uh, um, and quote unquote causal evidence uh, for uh, the role of active dendritic computation in uh, in. Uh, um, several aspects of neuronal behavior. I put uh, causal in the quotes because uh, it's very difficult uh, in a, in a nonlinear system uh, which is tightly coupled, which is the brain, uh, it's very difficult to perturb one particular thing and say that this is what is uh, responsible for that. That causal establishment becomes much more difficult. Uh, but as much as possible, these kinds of research have been done uh, pretty much with every sensory region which is accessible. Uh, uh, and there have been lines of evidence uh, uh, um, positive, negative, uh, to show that uh, the active dendritic computations indeed do have roles in, uh, in behavior one way or the other, basically. Thanks for such Broadly. a detailed answer. Thank you, that was a very intensive talk. So I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned that there are variety of anatomical structures in terms of dendrite that somatic and then single oblique, double oblique and so on. So do you comment that varying the number of single unique architecture is going to Varying the? Uh, varying a particular anatomical structure like oblique or double oblique or the somatic or whatever, will it have an effect on the, the speed of transmission of the information in terms of functionality? Would you comment on that? So you are, um, the, the question is, I mean, just to make sure that I got the question right. Uh, so, so you have these various different structures. There is the trunk, there is the oblique, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you are asking whether if you change the structure associated with this particular neuron, uh, whether there would be a change in the, in the propagation velocity and things like that. Is yes, that the, if you okay. So, um, so the propagation velocity is dependent upon several factors. Uh, it is dependent upon the structure because, I mean, say for instance, if it is, uh, if it has to face like multiple uh, um, branch points uh, before it reaches that particular location and there are other escape routes basically, that would affect it one. Uh, the second that effect would be the diameter of the, of the cable itself. Uh, and the third one is the number of channels that are present, both active as well as passive channels that are present. Uh, so there are several different factors that contribute to the propagation velocity, right? So, so only the structure alone would, of course, contribute to it, uh, but you can have a, I mean, fat dendrite. Uh, so fatter the dendrite, you would have uh, the propagation velocity to be higher. That's the usual uh, uh, link, basically. But you can still have a fatter dendrite, uh, but you can have the channel density to be very different uh, and have the propagation velocity to be very different. So, so the short answer to the question is yes, the morphology would play a role in, um, in propagation velocity, but there are also other different uh, um, components which would contribute to both passive and active propagation velocities. Uh, so that's not the only one actually. Right? So. Cool talk, Rishi. Uh, uh, I was uh, wondering if I could ask a couple of related questions. Uh, one of the things is, uh, uh, what is the output of the astrocyte that 
you know, under myonestol uh, stimulus uh, in form of what chemical neurotransmitter is this? And then secondly, wherever you see the spike in the dendrite, which is at a distant location, is it uh, just the spatial distance between the astrocyte and that location on the dendrite, or is it something, uh, a, a different uh, property that gets affected? Um, so um, the first question, um, so it actually, I mean, the, the, the gliotransmission could be uh, several different molecules. It could be GABA, it could be glutamate, it could be as, aspartate and things like that. Uh, here we left it deliberately vague because there is a debate going on as to whether it is aspartate or, uh, or uh, uh, glutamate. Uh, so they act on these NMDA receptors, which are uh, classically, um, I mean, a glutamate receptor, but they also respond to aspartate. Uh, so um, um, we do not know, we don't want to comment on whether it is glutamate or astrocyte. Uh, so the idea is that it releases one of these uh, active molecules which goes and binds onto the NMDA receptor and, uh, and uh, um, that leads to this. Uh, so the second question on, um, on um, the, the distance between the point of activation and the point of recording, uh, uh, which is what the question is, right? Uh, so so the, 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 at the point of activation, uh, so the astrocytes get onto NMDA receptors which are much more slower, right? So, so the, on the synaptic terminals, if there is a neuron-neuron connection, uh, so those are receptors which are much more faster, right, on the order of like, uh, the, the decay time constant would be on the order of 50 milliseconds or so. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at these receptors, which are NR2B, 2D receptors, uh, so they have a decay time constant of like 200, 400 milliseconds, uh, which is why you have those, uh, um, those very slowly dying down uh, um, things. Uh, and it turns out that the cable properties are um, much more, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, less punishing, I mean much less punishing uh, to slower signals uh, compared to faster signals because of the capacitance that is present over there. Uh, so the spread will be much more for these slower signals. Uh, so even if uh, you have the distance to be large enough, uh, the, the propagation will still be there. Uh, and because they are very large amplitude signal, you have like a 200, 300 picoampere current coming inside. Uh, which is a pretty large signal and therefore that can also travel down to even the cell body. So we were able to see those signals as uh, two, three millivolt signals, uh, even at the cell body, which itself is uh, pretty huge. Uh, compare it with synaptic inputs that come onto individual neurons, that's on the order of 0.2 millivolts. Uh, right? so, so these signals are, I mean, tenfold larger, even at the cell body. Um, um, and if you record from the dendrite, they're on the order of 30, 40 millivolts. that particular uh, aspect of it, the extracellular matrix, of course, uh, plays a critical role, uh, not just in terms of uh, um, bringing about appropriate diffusion for, uh, for the neurotransmitters and the gliotransmitters to reach their uh, uh, location, uh, in terms of uh, maintaining uh, the, the balance uh, in terms of what goes into the cerebrospinal fluid, the ionic concentrations and things like that. Uh, so the extracellular matrix does much more things than what we thought uh, they would be doing actually. And uh, if you look at an electron microscopic picture of, uh, of a neuropel, uh, it's like so tightly packed, it's not like individual neurons placed over there. Uh, they're so tightly packed, the extracellular matrix kind of uh, also holds it in place basically. So, so yes, it does uh, affect everything. But as I said, I mean, it's a huge nonlinear system with, I mean, so many interactions between each other. It's difficult to account for everything that is present over there. So what one does typically is that one chooses uh, specific aspects of it and shows necessity and sufficient for that. And the hope is that uh, you will be able to build from that basically, right? So that's the idea. Um, the, the, the talk that I showed about uh, local field potentials, uh, there I needed those in the impedance calculations. Uh, without that, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So what people have done is they have put two electrodes. Um, they would inject a current into this particular electrode, both of them in the extracellular matrix. Uh, 
and you would measure um, in a distance dependent manner uh, how exactly it is reaching at that particular location and they wouldn't just stop at that. Uh, they would also pass different frequencies on the kilohertz range uh, and ask whether it is purely resistive in nature uh, or is it also going to have a capacitive component to the impedance associated with it. Uh, and the short answer is that for the frequencies that we are interested in, action potentials and stuff like that, it is resistive, right? So, so for the LFP calculations that I showed, uh, it is purely resistive. Uh, so the capacitive part is uh, extremely minimal for the frequencies um, until like uh, two, three kilohertz, uh, you don't see any capacitive component. Uh, and even if you see filtering, it's because of the intracellular filtering. Uh, there are long debates and arguments, but now it's kind of settled that it's purely resistive mostly. And uh, um, the filtering that you observe, the one over F signal that you observe in, in the brain is largely a consequence of the, the capacitive filtering within the neuron, not outside the neuron. Right? There are long arguments and uh, um, several reams of paper printed. Are you sure it is a 